So, a few months ago, I heard an excerpt from prehistoric bone flute. And even though the scaling was a bit off, it didn't sound cacophonous. And that got me thinking, I should totally make a flute. Well, it started with this one. This was a fun little whittling project. But, as you can tell, it sort of don't resolve. Like, when you hear it, it goes... <whistles> this thing was made completely... <laughs> like, I drilled a hole by hand. Um, I did turn it a bit on the lathe, then I decided, you know what, I'm gonna whittle the rest by hand. The wind wear was sort of okay. I really didn't like the tone, as, and as you can tell, it's not particularly loud. But there's quite a bit of like lint on the labium, so I figured I'd try to work a bit on the wind wear. Maybe I can make something that was actually kind of playable, and. Here I ex experimented with a curved wind weight because it would fit the ball better though. But uh, it still sounded a bit raspy. So <coughs> for flute number three, I was quite meticulous about getting the lay beam just right. And as you can tell, Longer flute, because deeper tone, obviously. Um, what's particular about this one is that it has a completely straight bore, and when you actually do the calculations for like the acoustic length, if you have a straight bore, what you measure is pretty much the acoustic length. So. I was pleasantly surprised when I just measured up length, drilled the holes, and then... Which is fairly close to scale, not exactly, but... I was... I was feeling I was on the right track. However, as you perhaps noticed lower notes has almost no sound pressure whereas the high notes and the part of me that likes to pretend he's an electrical engineer was sort of screaming in the back of my head Transmission line! Impedance matching! <sighs> that would involve a lot of matrix multiplication and oh. So I was sort of guessing that mm, that's probably a reason why recorders are split in two. <laughs> it's probably so they can make a tapered board. And I've looked it up and they do have a tapered board. They chose a conical, but uh, for convenience, for flute number four, I made it segmented. I uh, also uh, tapered the bore. Uh, then I was just stabbing it with a file, and it did definitely improve the sound pressure of all the holes, but. The spacing of the holes were completely off. But developments on the wind way and reading up a bit on the phenomena of edge tone, I I sort of felt that I nailed the wind way and labium. Uh, not necessarily the wind way, we'll come back to that. Um, but the window and labium 
I felt like I had nailed it. And... Mm, sounds nice. Uh, but uh, all the tape is from all the holes that I missed. And by this point I was thinking, well... It would be nice to actually have a like playable flute. Something that I could use in the back of recordings and stuff like that. But now that we had a tapered ball and the spacing was all wonky, how would we figure out what was the correct spacing and what can we do to mitigate it? Because an ordinary flute has evenly spaced holes for the correct fingering. But I obviously required a deeper understanding of how does a flute actually work. And what well, started off as a fun whittling project, I can say, we're having fun no more. We'll get back to the edge tone phenomenon. Uh, let's say we get some characteristic numbers that we relate to the length of tube, known as straw numbers. Uh, now, in order to understand this phenomenon, we need to derive the acoustic wave equation. So it starts off with a linearizing of the commute equation and Euler's equation of motion. Uh, those are not really that iffy. Uh, what's rather a bit iffy is our choice of equation of state. Now you could make your life easy and assume that yeah it's an adiabatic process and then you would have an adiabatic bulk modulus. Uh, but also remember that when you start blowing in a flute the pitch is lower than when you have played it for a little bit. So clearly energy is lost to the system in some way. We are changing the thermodynamics of the system simply by blowing hot air into it. Uh, and generally air is a rather non-linear medium. But if we assume, assume, assume it's all good, we can derive the acoustic wave equation. And this sort of ties up. We need to also derive uh, Bernoulli's equation for potential flow. Because uh, we will need that in the derivation of Webster's Horn equation. Uh, this is sort of the analogy of the wave equation, but for tapered horn. So, uh, if we see that we have this, uh, this uh, uh, spatial derivative uh, with uh, the natural logarithm of S, where S is the cross-sectional area of a tube. Uh, so, you can probably guess why my choice of taper for the bore ended up being an exponential taper, known as an exp exponential horn. It also has rather nice loading characteristics. Um, that will probably be for a different video. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can also use Webster's horn equation and the acoustic wave equation a bit woosy woosy in order to drive uh, numbers such as the terminating impedance, reflectance, uh, numbers, numbers, numbers. And what's neat about the flute is that it actually behaves quite like a transmission line. Because you have, well, you have some AC driver, which is the edge tone phenomenon, and then you have the ball, and you have the ends that are coupled to the field. Um, uh, I think it's a bit funny because you can, if you look at the bore of flute as um, inductor and you look at the ends of a flute as the two parts of a capacitor, you realize that it's just an LC circuit, which I think is pretty neat. But on with this knowledge and what manipulating the holes of a flute does to the sound of a flute, we can finally get going with actually making the final flute. Wait, 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 because uh, 
I had taken a lot of that into account when I made flute number five. Um, if we have a look, we can see that I have a sort of flared horn uh, at the window and the labium is rather nice, quite straight, a teensy, teensy bit of bristle right in the middle, but nothing to care about. As you can also tell, I have quite dirty fingers all the time. And I would have been finished if it wasn't for the fact that I was not aware of how important the mechanics of the wind wave was to the playability of the flute. Because this one I experimented with uh, flared openings. Uh, and you can do a lot of tuning. Uh, what I've figured out since uh, is that for the, like recorders, they just drill a round hole and they widen it up from the inside. Um, um, oh, what is it called? Uh, we'll think about it. But a small demonstration. can't do high notes and it has all to do everything to do with how the wind way is shaped and in this case it's just that it's too tall you're not getting the right jet to exit the orifice with the right speed also there's some additional mechanics because you, you sort of want to widen uh, a section of the wind way uh, or make it t taller to say um, and that helps with back propagation, uh, uh, back propagating waves. So you have a sort of uh, filter uh, that stops the sort of resonating. If like when you stop blowing a not well made flute, you will notice a sort of kickback to the. You will notice the air, uh, the resonance inside of the tube will sort of push back through the wind wave. Um, but with better design and a better machine, um, that would be solvable. Uh, I was still messing around quite a bit with the spacing, like even though you do calculation, like e even within the field, you sort of uh, there's disagreement about how how you actually could calculate the correction factor and stuff like that. Mm. So the best thing to do, as I learned from this one, was eh, just drill the whole swab and then you just tune it until it hits wherever you want. Now there are problems with that, like in this one, the opening for these holes got way too big and that's why you get a sort of but it was looking like the pieces were finally falling into place. So this project starts off with a piece of rowan that came from a tree that blew over in the spring. Yeah, it's not properly dried. That will come back and haunt me. The piece was then turned down on the lathe in order to fit the windway machine. and the center drilled out with a spiral bit because I had nothing else.
got to make a template for the wind weight machine first and then it's aligning the head to the wind weight machine so here we can see the template in place and there's a two to one advantage so whatever you do on the left side in elevation will get half on the other side and the translation is identical though obviously I'm mm, pretty sure that's a more appropriate drill bit that I don't own for this but whatever works So I have this bar in the tool post and I align it to the roof of the windway and then I lock the spindle with the back gear. Pretty big no-no, but it lets me drill the hole right at the back of the exit to the windway. A pair of temporary plugs lets me hold the head between centers while I give it a good sanding. So while I clean up some lint, it's time to talk about edge tone. Because when you have a jet of air that exits an orifice and hits a sharp edge, you will get a pressure differential. And this differential sets up a oscillatory motion uh, in its vicinity. Now there are a lot of the underlying mechanics of this phenomena that is still a mystery. But we have certain parameters that we can characterize the system by. First, we have the distance from the orifice to the edge. And if I can be so bold as to make a naming suggestion, well, we can call it the band gap. Because there are some odd similarities between this action and the light emitting diode. Next, we have uh, the frequency of oscillation, F. Uh, and then we have the speed uh, which the particles exits the orifice. And we can combine this into a dimensionless number that's known as the Strohal number. And we can do similar treatment for the bore, where we have the acoustic length uh, times the frequency over the wave speed or the speed of sound. Now, for some given frequency, we could set these equal, and this is indeed the basis for scaling of organ pipes. But for flute, it gets more complicated, because you have varying acoustic length, and we haven't even looked at the phenomena of uh, different stages. So, when you increase the velocity uh, in a flute, you will suddenly make a abrupt shift to a higher frequency. Uh, and as you keep going, you can get to a set third and fourth, and uh, I th don't know how many stages are technically possible. Another interesting phenomena is when you go back, so like when you're lowering the speed, you can usually go further back uh, in velocity, so you get this hysteresis effect. So I turned down this piece of oak to fit the bore of the head of the flute and this other piece is going to be the floor of the windway.
just marking it off and then I cut it off with the chisel off camera. Now I've since learned that actual proper luthiers carve this component out of a single piece, no lathe, which is pretty impressive. And it's all about getting the right grain direction and controlling expansion with moisture. Um, which is why I went for water repellent wood glue. So here you see me working on the window, and my window has two components to it. It has the sort of what takes stabilizing mechanism of the back end of the labium, and perpendicular to that you have an approximation by hand of an exponential horn. The idea with this feature is to make the internal cavity more collinear with the streamlines of the vortex that's inside the flute. And if we align the plug to the back of the windway, we can give it a first whistle. Nice. So I think it's time for us to divert off on our first tangent because we need to make the reamer in order to get the right profile in the ball. So I cut out the template and then I started turning down a piece of wood. I was initially going to use this to sound cast the aluminium reamer. Um, um, but laziness got the better of me, so I figured, well, why not just try with wood?
man, her impatience got better of me. This thing may have actually worked quite fine if I had used the heat resistant epoxy. But instead we're using pitch. Because it dries immediately. Had to straighten off the cutting edge a bit and round off the back. And a coat of linseal oil just to seal everything up. I used the same Rowan for the bore. Uh, now it's just a question whether we can find a section without knot. I'm just giving it a rough turn down uh, in order to fit the contraption we'll see in a bit. Uh, I don't have a steady rest or gun ball set up, uh, may make one in the future, uh, but I do have some really long spiral bits and this thing, which is just some threaded rod and a plate and some washers and some nuts and uh, you'll sort of see how it works or doesn't depending on your view. Um, and it doesn't give a perfectly centered hole either, but it gives a straight hole and we can turn off the run out.
yeah, I told you it wouldn't be scented. <laughs> but at least it's straight. And we have more than enough room to take off the run out. Now it's time to actually try out the Remo, and it comes up immediately, but after that it sort of worked, like I felt like I was making progress, so much so that I was ignoring that it was getting hot, and eventually it got so hot that the pitch melted, so when I pulled the tube back, the copper tube came out with it as well and promptly slammed into my wrist. But I'm fine, nothing to worry about, I was wearing safety glasses. And we need to cut off another piece for the bell, and turn it down on the lathe.
here I'm using a wooden dowel as a mandrel in order to shape a thick gauged copper wire into a ring. Uh, that's going to be for the end grain of the flute and protect the joint. Applying some rosin that will be collected later in this video. And then soldered it with a torch. I made a second ring for the other side off camera and glue them with CA glue. After the glue had set light, I assembled the flute and turned it between centers. And then a coat of linseed oil to protect it from my greasy fingers. I'm just cutting off a small piece from the leftovers from the plug to the head of the flute uh, because we'll need that later. Oh, would you look at that? We're already off on a second tangent because we're gonna need a hand drill in order to drill some pretty oblique holes. So back inside we take the small wedge that we cut off and we're going to fit it to the plug. And then you align the plug in just the right place and using this contraption that I've basically stolen from the sound post placing things violin makers use um, we can place the wedge just where it needs to be with some CA glue and if there's a mistake it's easy to bore it out again and yeah, I think this design simplifies a lot of construction without necessarily any compromise. Now, you just saw me seal up the end grain with some CA glue. And in order to get it perfectly flat again, we're gonna sand it on a surface plate. Going in figure eight while trying to keep the pot as level as possible. Then it's cutting out the mouthpiece. I'm just using the sanding drum I'm going to use in a bit for reference. I 
and some finishing touches. Now, I figured that it was mostly the ball that was the problem with the previous flute, so I used the same calculations and just transfer the holes with a bit of modifications. The angle which you drill the holes greatly affects the acoustic length and therefore the pitch, and so does the width of the hole, uh, as well as whether you undercut it or flare it, as in my case. Uh, I drilled the holes with quite a small diameter, making sure that I was a wee bit flat of the key I was going for. Because you can always tune sharper by removing material with a needle file. And then you just flare the horn or undercut it in order to get the sound characteristics that you want. Now, the new board design gave way lower pitch than I expected, and I had to cut quite a bit of the bell. And using a tuner and a spectrum analyzer, I start the initial voicing of the flute, trying to establish a good harmonic representation and a stable fundamental. As you can see, we're getting close to something playable, but we're still quite flat, and I will leave it flat until after I put on the varnish, then we'll do a final voicing. And speaking of varnish, what is this, the third tangent? We need to make some varnish. So I'm just going to make a small burner out of this can, and then it's off to the woods to collect some rosin. With our rosin collected, we can put it on the low simmer in order to decrease the viscosity and hopefully get it through our strainer. But you may have to help it along a bit with a heat gun. Any leftovers you just throw out. And then you add about a third of linseed oil and let it stand overnight. The next day the particulates have settled out and you can pour it over into another mason jar. And put it on a low simmer in order to boil off any water or turpentine. But now since you've boiled off the turpentine you need to add some back in. And I gotta say, I'm pretty pleased with the result. It really makes the wood come alive! That's a good one. 
Yeah, yes, it was. If you listen in the background, you can hear the brakes crackle. And at last, we have the final voicing. Well, technically not the final one. I'm still a bit flat, uh, but I'm waiting till the wood dries out properly because I can't work with that anymore because uh, it just keeps shifting. But other than that, I would say that I'm quite pleased with the flute. There are some minor things that I would have changed but it has a good harmonic representation, it has a clear fundamental, it has a wide register, and all in all, it's a quite playable flute, considering that it's the sixth flute I've ever made. Now I just have to learn how to play the flute. Thanks for watching.